You're gonna wanna stick around to the end of this video. What I heard about the future of our food supply is terrifying. I didn't know anything about it beforehand, but I'm glad I picked the right guy to talk to. Just wow. Well, here's a typical farmer. One of the men our armed forces and we at home depend upon for food. And boy, oh boy, is he busy. His machinery scarce, his gasoline is rationed, the tires on his truck are wearing down. The good old American farmer. Folks were tough and macho and had no excuses. Sun up to sun down and all. It was a very honorable profession to work hard on the farms and provide. Some would say that's what made us such a great nation. This is what your typical farm worker looks like now. They're still tough and macho and work all day. The difference is just about everyone out here is from Central America. Did you know there's a place in the United States where 97% of the population is Hispanic? It's true. We're in it right now. But by the way things are going, this place might not even be here one day. Uh-oh. You know what that is? That's a machine picking crops. One day, this here machine will probably replace a lot of migrant field workers. Currently, these dudes can harvest certain crops, but one day, machines like this will be able to plant, pick, and sort just about everything we grow. But that's a long time away. Or is it? We're here in Central California. This region is by far the country's biggest producer of agriculture. It's not even close. They could probably feed half the world if they needed to. All but 8% of the field workers out here are Hispanic. It's been like that for like 50 years now. This is Huron, population 6,000. This is Fresno County, which is just about smack dab in the middle of California's agriculture country, as you can get. If you look at a chart of the poorest cities in California, you'll see at the top, Huron. 40% of the people who live here live in poverty. That means the average employed person here makes less than 20K a year. Most of their expensive possessions are just their cars and their wedding rings. But I don't think they're going to be here forever. Almost every single person in this city is a temporary field worker. They can make about 20 bucks an hour, and I don't know if they limit the number of hours you can work these days. But it's tough work. You knew that already. Every little bit of money these farm workers can save, they do. They send some back home, but their biggest goal is to try to buy a house of their own and maybe transition out of this type of work. A lot of the kids who grow up here wind off going to college, too. But are these people in Huron unhappy? Do they even care that they're considered poor? This all sure does look different than in Atherton, where I was just the day before. That's the wealthiest place in the country, where people earn more in a year than many of these people will ever make in their lives. Of course, as we watch this video, there's thousands of migrants at our southern border hoping to gain entry so they can find some respectable work. Some of them will probably wind up here, in Huron. Robots aren't the biggest threat to the future of farm labor. Wherever you go in California, there's drama. And here is no exception. In Fresno County, their drama is all about water. There's been a drought here, and agencies have been cutting off water access for farmers all over this county. That means a lot of the lettuce, onion, and tomato fields nearby are in jeopardy. You only have to go back 10 years for the last water crisis here. Back then, a lot of farmers had to let their crops just rot in the fields. And by the end of it all, almost half of all field workers had no work. There were signs all over Huron that said, Congress created Dust Bowl. At one point, it looked like this entire city would become a ghost town. Well, it's kind of happening again.
all over the Central Valley, there are once again fields that are being left to rot. There's just not enough water. Plus, uh-oh, we've seen this before, America. We're starting to import more food from other countries now. That'll put people out of work. That's why a lot of people in Huron save their cash. They never know when there's going to be another fork in the road. It used to be during harvest season here, the population in Huron would triple. There'd be 20 or 30 people crammed into these small houses. Today, there's families leaving Huron, trying to see if they need to find another line of work. But let's just put aside the notion that these folks take government aid. These are good, hardworking, honest people. The last time the water crisis hit, a lot of the residents here were too embarrassed or proud to take free food and clothing. We don't want handouts, we want work, they said. I wish our citizens thought that way. Did you know 75% of a household's water usage is for lawns? Oh man, Mappy, I water my front and backyards every day. Do you think I should stop so that this city won't go bankrupt? I don't think one person matters that much. We all need to. Okay, I'll stop. Anybody else want to stop watering their lawns too? No. It doesn't take very long to drive around here on. It's just a few neighborhoods, really. It's a very beige, basic place. Simple homes that are well maintained. Some parts of town look like something you'd see in Mexico. The average home price here is 250k, which is an absolute steal in this state. This house sold for $14,500 not too long ago. Not too shabby. Here's what the most expensive home in town looks like. This place sold for 300k a bit ago. Just a nice quiet house on the edge of almond fields. It's very quiet here. I was actually really surprised when I saw the crime numbers in Huron. Apparently it's three times more dangerous here than in the average California city. I read about stories of gangs and drug trades taking hold here. One mayor had his car shot up by a machine gun and a council member had her home bombed and another mayor's son was assassinated? <laughs> My God. Well, we're going to get to the bottom of that when we talk to Huron's current mayor in a bit, who I have to say is maybe the coolest politician I've ever talked to. You actually might be surprised to hear that Huron's pretty progressive in its growth. It's definitely not stagnant here. There's a medical center here now, and they have a fire department here and a police station too. Huron has a newish elementary school. The high school kids here have an hour-long bus ride though. That sucks. It's 90 minutes to get to anything that might be considered somewhat entertaining. There's 10 Mexican restaurants and a park in town. That's just about it. But I don't think the Huron adults have a lot of time for fun anyways. And since I was here, I had to try the tacos. It does not get any more authentic than that, people. <laughs> Damn. They were pretty much the best tacos I ever had. And there's some cops back there. And I'm drinking my cerveza in the parking lot and it said I'm gonna get in trouble, so I better go. And we're gonna talk about the town's tacos with the mayor too. Tacos. Everything in California is political. The whole water shortage problem is leaving entire cities here worrying about survival. The higher ups in Sacramento, they think the water shortage is being caused by a change in our climate. So by 2035, every car sold in this state will have to be electric. Though it's actually debatable whether or not electric vehicles are actually better for the environment or not. Since, you know, making the batteries is so extensive. And check out this transition. Huron is the greenest migrant farm worker community in the country. The, the city bought a bunch of electric cars that residents can borrow and go wherever they want for free. What? That's just crazy. 
a place where just about half the place is in poverty and everybody's from south of the border, they're leading the way to be 100% green in California? There's a commercial about it in everything. I'm sure there's some strange looks when a migrant farm worker in a cowboy hat climbs out of a Tesla in downtown Bakersfield. There's another interesting twist to the whole green thing. The drought's making land unfarmable, so the state's now putting in solar panels in former fields. Well, somebody has to make those solar panel parts. Huron people are being trained to do just that. So in an ironic twist, the sun is taking away jobs, but giving jobs right back in return. Folks south of the border are very hard workers. They take pride in their work, and they don't cost a lot of money. They're just nice people. Most of them are just friendly, good-natured folks who go to church and love their families. It's too bad a lot of our population isn't as innocent and honest, humble and hardworking as the folks out here in Huron. I have to say, this is way nicer than a lot of places in San Bernardino. It's way better here than a lot of Los Angeles. There's no homelessness and ghetto people walking around. You don't have crackheads everywhere. You have to worry about your car window getting broken. People aren't rude and blowing weed smoke at your kids inside the gas station. What the hell, California? Take a lesson from here on, I say. But it's all very odd. So much wealth is generated here, but the residents hardly see any of it. They just patiently keep their heads down, hoping for a little piece of the American dream. That is, unless the drought runs them out of here. Or this does. Then what will they do? Now, normally, some of you skip the interviews at the end of these videos. But you need to watch the upcoming conversation. I'm not going to lie. It paints a really scary future for our nation's food supply. So, Manuel, you told me on the phone that big cities like L.A. and San Francisco don't care about field workers. What did you mean by that? Well, they don't really care by the farmer or the field worker that produces the food for this country, this world. They don't because they don't worry about any of the things that are happening to farmers and the farm workers around this country. Case in point, we have farm workers that have been waiting to get their <clears throat> work authorization card, their green card, for 30 years. 30 years. And the farmers and the farm workers have been paying into the Social Security Administration. And this Congress and this Senate have not at all concerned themselves about their status. In 30 years, we haven't done any immigration other than what Ronald Reagan did, called IRCA. And those workers every day go to work at four in the morning, or three in the morning, or five in the morning, because of what they have to do with the farmer. And they prepare the food, irrigation, tractor work, harvesting, packing, you name it. These workers are preparing all this food, even during COVID. Nobody worried about the farm worker during COVID. The people in these large metropolitan cities don't really worry about even where the water. They, t they say that the farmers are using all the water. How can a farmer use the water if he's producing the food? The water that he's using is to produce the food for you people to eat, that you go to the grocery store and you buy it that the farm worker irrigates, harvests, cultivates, processes, packets, puts it on a truck and sends it off to the store. Yeah, you're with the Nisai Farmers League. What, what is your organization? It's a, a farm worker grower organization that was developed in the 1970s. Okay. To deal so with um, the unionization under Cesar Chavez, who was the Okay, so why why have these people been waiting 30 years to get their green card? Why, why, why the delay on that? Because Congress doesn't want to vote on it. Congress doesn't want to deal with this type of issue. I mean, even today, under this administration, 
we have next week to finish out a Senate version of the immigration bill that went from the House to the Senate, and it's been sitting there now for a year and a half. Why won't they vote on it? I don't understand. Just because they don't want to deal with immigration, because they want to use it for their election, per, uh, for their re being uh, voted into office. So they use that as the leverage. Oh, we're going to deal with immigration this year. We're going to really work hard on getting immigration done for all. We're going to we're going to do immigration. We're going to do border uh, safety. We're going to do a bunch of good things. And never happens. Never happens. Yeah. What? What percentage of so at the border, there's thousands and thousands of people waiting to try to get in. Um, what percentage of the people that come into the country from south of the border go out and work in fields, do you think? We have not had an increase into our agriculture over the past um, probably five to six years. Even if they're coming in, they're not coming into agriculture. Why? Why not? Is it because of the drought and the cutbacks in production and all the yeah, stuff I'm hearing? Just about? all of that stuff combination, yeah. And um, knowing that um, there's no work authorization and that um, they come in here for maybe amnesty or not amnesty, but for asylum, they come in for that and then they're being held and waiting for their court date or whatever it is. So for them, and agriculture is very seasonal. So, so they're going to go to where there's a job that could be more full-time, which could be now that COVID's opened up, um, they are now going into the restaurants, they're going into construction, uh, light-duty manufacturing, and those areas. But in agriculture, we have not had an increase um, from workers coming from the border that have been coming in over the past uh, five years. What's the future of farming in California? I hear drought. I hear robotic pick, picking. I hear water uh, issues. I hear that we're buying produce from overseas now. I, I, farms are clearly going to rot. There's less production in California, Central Valley right now. Are you worried about the future of, of agriculture production in California? I'm worried about the communities in these rural communities. We probably have about maybe a hundred small rural communities, maybe even more in the in the state. In the San Joaquin Valley, we've got uh, probably forty-eight rural small communities. They are the ones that are going to hurt dramatically. Not Los Angeles, not San Francisco, or even Sacramento. They're not going to hurt at all. There ain't going to be an impact. The only thing they care about, and the, is to go to the grocery store and go get it. That's all they care about. But agriculture as small farmers in our state are, Sacramento speaks forkedly out of their mouth, okay? In that they want to protect the small farmer. They say that we're going to protect the small minority farmer and all that. No, they craft legislation and regulations without even talking to agriculture, other than just the union, just the union. Okay, but that's not agriculture. And we've lost more small farmers. I've lost more small farmers in my organization. 40 acre, 50 acre, 80 acre are gone. And they're in their 70s and 80s. Is there like a percentage that you could, for frame of reference, on how much percentage that of farm workers and farms that we've lost and what you think it's going to be in the next 10 years? Oh, I would say um, we used to be about close to 800 thousand and two thousand probably in the whole year even with the migrant stream and today probably have oh i'm gonna say when the west side goes out probably 450 450 so almost half of the field workers are now gone where do you think we'll be in 10 years how many of that 450 you think will be left half so half wow so what if what? We're going to lose, just to give you, uh, Nick, an example. I have about four and a half million acres in the San Joaquin Valley, okay? Under Sigma, the water crisis issue, where the water goes to the fish and not to the workers, not to agriculture, not to the consumption of food. I'm going to take out a million acres by the year 2020, 
25, 26, 27 year, I'm going to take out a million acres on the west side of the San Joaquin Valley. That means the, the town you went and saw, Huron, will probably be very much three or four times, maybe even 70% smaller than what you saw. And several other smaller towns will probably pretty much start to dry up. So it's not a good picture for the small rural community because of what the water crisis has happened and the behavior of the state and the state legislature that have demonized agriculture and the farm workers in the sense because they have blamed farmers for taking the water. But how do you take water if you're growing food? You have to get the water somewhere to grow the food, don't you? Well, you know, they make a lot of silly decisions in Sacramento. You're you're just one of the victims of of the of the lack of uh, sensibility coming out of, of Sacramento. I I guess the question is, um, where are we going to get our food? Well, let me ask you this question, Nick. When you wake up in the morning, you know that your food was growing in the United States and you know that your food was growing in California, one of the most stringent food safety, food producing countries or states. But Nick wakes up and hears the ships out on the ocean unloading in Long Beach or Mississippi or New York Harbor. Containers coming from foreign countries with food in them. Kids, they drink milk, don't they? Most likely. How would you like to have your milk coming in from a third world country? Milk. Look what happened in China in 2004 with all those kids that died in China because of the contamination of what happened with milk. Canned milk. God, so we're outsourcing our food now? We're going to be outsourcing our food. That's what's going to be happening. And shame on us. And I hope that when we do that, that there is a real slap in the face of the Congress, Sacramento, and the large metropolitans that have demonized agricultural farmers and farm workers. Because... We could have taken care of, and we can take care of these workers. They are an integral part of everything we do. If it wasn't for the farm worker, we wouldn't have the food we have at all. And when you, when you went through that small town, you went through a town that has a great family heritage for, for generations. And if you went through Avenal or if you went through... Um, Farmersville, or you went through a Rosie Cutler, or Orange Cove, or even Patterson is disappearing up north, going in with houses and houses for the Bay Area. Good land, great land, and the governor now is putting solar on good farmland, solar. You'll never be able to put it back into the farming. And Mechanization can only be so much. You can't mechanize and pick grapes with a machine. Not in not in your lifetime, even. I've seen videos that show it, that they're making them. Picking grapes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I've seen it. I guess the question, the, the final question is, what? where are all of these 400,000 field workers going to go? What are they going to do if farming in California is slowly put out of business? Well, <clears throat> the question is, we took advantage of the farmer and the farm worker to get free food in the sense. And so what you did is that now those workers are going to lose their Social Security because they're not eligible to get it. And they're going to be 65 years old in 10 years. They'll be 70 years old. And we will have not allowed them to get their Social Security at all. So they're going to end up going back to the country of origin. 
Honduras, Mexico, whatever, you know, they're going to be going back to those countries because they won't be able to draw any social security here. How do they live? You don't so think that there's another, they, they can't get another job doing something else. Is there anything they can do that to transition from farming? Is there something else that we could use them for? If that's their whole life and that's their knowledge, pruning, irrigating, tractor work. Now, will there be some? Yes, there's going to be some. But the farms will no longer be a family farm. The farm will be a corporate farm owned by investors who only care to invest in the land for X period of time and then dump it. Not really caring about the land or caring about even the workers. Get in to make money and get out. Because the small farmer is gone, the medium-sized farmer is going to be gone, and then a large farmer. What is a large farmer? A thousand acres? That person is going to be gone. Can you imagine you can't make it on a thousand acres in this state, in this state? And you're going to, and it's going to get there. I, Emmanuel, I got to say, this is a very depressing conversation. I, I didn't know it was going to be uh, like this. I, I think that people need to understand what's happening. And um, I don't know if there's anything that anybody can actually do to stop. I the think so. Water. There is. What? Is that, I hate to say it like this. I think it's time that the f farmers in this country, but in, especially in this state, and the farm workers strike against California and, and don't work and don't produce food for a period of time and let the stores dry up. I'm sorry. Until they see the importance of a farmer and a farm worker and what they do, their families, I think it's the only answer at the end of the day is that when you hit their pocketbook, and you take away the food out of the stores, just like when, would you ever have believed in your lifetime that you would have saw a shortage of toilet paper during COVID? Toilet paper, of all things. Not food, huh, at the time. And now there's a big concern about food. Yeah, there is. So um, I think if agriculture is going to survive, it's going to have to change its ways in the people of this country and especially in this state, in Sacramento, are going to have to respect farmers, and they don't. And they don't, res they don't respect the farmer and the farm worker. They say they do. They lie. They absolutely lie. It it's sad, I and that's all I can say is that, and it's sad for you and your generation to have to be put through that we, my generation, and even younger ones, have caused this problem in Sacramento and in Washington, D.C. And then suddenly Sacramento has gotten into a virus, a disease. You know, the governor of this state has never met with the farmers, the farm groups. He has not. And he's come to Fresno probably 50 times, 40 times, and never said, hey, I want to meet with the ag leaders. I want to talk with these farmers to see what can I do to help make things better. It didn't happen. Did you just eat, did you eat some of that amazing food? I made some pollo right now, man. We're barbecuing a bunch of stuff downstairs. Did the, right. the, 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 the tacos at the jet shop are the best tacos I've ever had, Ray. <laughs> I believe it. You know what? The jet stop just closed their doors. So these guys, um, they re relocated to the liquor store, uh, oh. Rhino Liquor Store. So next time you come, they'll be at Rhino's. Yeah. I bet that it's it's hard to compete. You got to be really good in here on, or you're going to go out of business, man. Yeah, because uh, we're, all, we're all taco eaters, bro. We, we, we know when people are trying to fuck around, you know. Well, talk to me about Huron, man. Uh, it seems like a really nice place with nice people. Um, I, I, what is it like there right now, currently in Huron? Oh, right now it's extremely cold, man, and uh, it's a crazy um, cold spell coming through from up north, and it's hitting us as well. And I've been giving out some of those uh, mylar blankets to some of the homeless folks. We probably got about ten homeless folks out here, and. Um, <clears throat> 
And so here on right now, it's pretty dead in terms of work. I think there's some lingering work in the pomegranate finishing up uh, some uh, organic cotton that they're trying to harvest. But if it's foggy, they can't do it. So my brother, uh, he works in that uh, uh, in, in, in that uh, the company that harvests cotton. <clears throat> so that is not because it was too foggy. But um, but really in the wintertime, it's pretty dead in terms of work. Maybe there's some folks uh, <clears throat> uh, working in orchards, or they used to be. Now the machines pretty much uh, trim all the trees. But um, but no, it's uh, it's 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 pretty rough out here in here with the drought. You know, there's not as much farm jobs, but there are uh, many gigawatts of solar power that are being uh, uh, of, of solar parks that are being installed. And we got about 18 years worth of solar park uh, development. And so uh, one thing that I'm doing, I'm also <clears throat> a founder of the LEAP Institute. It's a nonprofit. I brought it uh, to Huron with me when I moved back. I still have my office in Fresno, but I opened up a shop here. And we do a number of things. Uh, but one of the things that we do is uh, provide solar uh, installation uh, 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 trainings, uh, certified trainings, for uh, for folks to transition them from uh, from the farm from harvesting crops to harvesting the sun. <clears throat> That's and good, so, man. Yeah, because I mean, it seems like a lot of the people there are, are going to have to worry about their future because the farms are not maybe going to be as plentiful job wise mm -hmm. as they were. So I was going to ask you, there is a transitional opportunity for them, man. That's good. Yeah, and that's one of the things that we're doing in uh, in our what we call the Uplift the Valley Green Workforce Development Program. Uh, we also uh, we also train uh, electric vehicle operators. Uh, we have a fleet of eleven uh, electric cars, and we transport farm worker families to medical appointments. We're going to be starting up a new system to transport students to college and university. And uh, we're next twenty twenty three. We're going to start providing a training uh, for folks who get certified in electric vehicle charger maintenance and installation. So we're doing, we're doing a bunch of stuff out of this little shop. We, I got here. <clears throat> That's good. Man. Uh, my, my hometown doesn't even, isn't even doing any of that stuff. Say I'm from San Bernardino. They don't have any of that. I don't think they have any of that stuff going on. So mm -hmm. that, well, that's yeah. A fun fact is uh, my city. It's a small city, a little over 6,000 on paper. In reality, I think we have more like closer to nine, 10,000. But uh, we're the city in the country with the most TV chargers per capita. I got we got thirty level two chargers and four DC fast chargers uh, here in the community. Uh, we just need uh, the for the you know we have farm worker families, average uh, median household income, <clears throat> median household income of about twenty three k, probably a little more than that. But uh, but the electric vehicles are still not not affordable enough, you know. Uh, one study that was done a uh, number of years back shared that uh, about 60, at least 60 percent of farm workers were using 40 percent of their monthly wages for trans transportation. <clears throat> mm. So, uh, so yeah, so you know, and us being able to provide the service to transport them, uh, and then we 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 get the insurance to pay. And it, it saves them a hundred bucks a trip because otherwise they would have to pay a hundred bucks for somebody to give them a ride to Fresno or, or somewhere else. And, you know, it's a, uh, there's a lot of <clears throat> elements that are, that have been uh, hitting my families, you know, who earn a very uh, modest wage, if I could put it that way, uh, hit them with different costs that really, I mean, just perpetuate poverty in the area. So trying to change that, that's great, man. So when when it's off season, do most of those people still live in Huron, or, or do they take? Do, yeah, what do they well, do all right now, yeah, that that is the case. I mean, in terms of migrant uh, migrants, uh, migrant farm workers, it's way less nowadays. You know, uh, does somebody right now, own all those homes? Like, does somebody own all the homes and then they rent from them, or do they own them? They <clears throat> there's some families that have settled, but there's a lot of families that rent. And um, and there's not enough housing in my community, but we are building two uh, two uh, multi-family developments, about sixty something units per per development, and uh, we're working on. Uh, we just finished building 
um, the development of single family uh, homes. And uh, we're working on another 55 to 80 single family homes. So it's, uh, <clears throat> you know, there's, uh, there's people that are in apartments right now that are ready to buy a house and, and they don't leave here on. They don't want to leave here on, you know. They they prefer to kind of like uh, wait till the homes are built, you know. Uh, once you grow a community, once you are, you know, part of a community, it's it's not something that it's easily easy to 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 grow anywhere else, you know. It, it takes a while to grow a community where where your families have known each other for two, three generations, you know. Yeah, that's that's great. Um I hear it, the, the crime is surprisingly rated higher than what it feels like when you're there. I drive around, it feels like the safest place. Um, mm. I heard about former mayors, kids dying and houses getting blown up. Is is there like a game? Are, are you worried about your safety? What's going on there, dude? No, I think uh, back in the days, uh, you know, about 10 plus years back, there was a lot of conflict, you know, um, and and that pretty much has died down. I mean, the conflict that exists is more uh, more um, idea wise rather than you know threat wise. <clears throat> and so so it's I think it's calmed down a lot. And uh, in terms of the gangs that we used to have, you know, a lot of uh, the shot callers are basically you know stored away right now on vacation, <clears throat> and some of them on vacation for good. But the, uh, the, shot caller, the what? The bad people? Well, the 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 shot callers of uh, some of the gangs, you know, they're basically locked up. Well, not basically, they are locked up uh, or have uh, left the city, and so uh, so the that activity has uh, has uh, has gone down a, a great deal. Uh, but what's more important, and the way I see it, is. Uh, <clears throat> You know, early on, when I was still in college, I started a youth group here, mentored a lot of young people with the hopes that they some of them would stick around and do the continue the organizing uh, that, that didn't happen. And when I came back, you know, and people complained about the violence and uh, and and they, they'll, on one end, they'll complain about the violence or the youth gangs. On the other end, they don't volunteer one hour or, you know, any time of their life to advance uh, youth uh, programming. There's a lot of work, you know, and I continue to try to convince people, you know, uh, <clears throat> that uh, if we want to see a community that is thriving, we got to understand that it doesn't fall onto our laps, you know. Uh, it's something that we got to sacrifice time, we got to sacrifice energy, and sometimes we got to sacrifice resources, you know. How did you end up in Huron? <clears throat> My father ended up in Huron in 1951. There's an orphan farm worker. Uh, from Michoacan, undocumented, and there were people here from uh, the cluster of villages from where we're from, out there in Michoacan. And um, so I was born in Fresno. I grew up here and uh, in the neighboring city. And uh, and so I've always had a you know uh, that that uh, that special place in my heart for Huron, you know, because this is where I kind of started growing up, and I would be here every when when my parents split up. Uh, I had to grow up, you know, out there where my parents was at, where my mom was at, but I would always come back home uh, or come back to Huron with my dad and uh, my original friends that I've, you know, some of which I don't even remember when I when we met because we were like infants, you know, and uh, they're still my friends to this day. And so uh, just, I don't know, just uh, the vibe, the story, and the fact that this is a community that has so much potential and I want to be part of the uh, unlocking of that potential and taking it to the next level. So if we're going to survive this, it's going to have to be together. Otherwise, it's going to be disaster. Yeah, I have to say, for a small field worker uh, community um, way out in, in the middle of the Central Valley, it, I, I like it a lot. It's not what I expected. And um, I think a lot of people should be inspired by the amount of uh, work that you guys are doing to change your your future and take hold of, of what you guys need to do to – exist the way you want to and not not be holding to the state and and keep keep fighting and, and it's a great place so hopefully everybody can continue to make Huron great and and i i'm worried that you guys are gonna possibly not have a lot large population one day um so hopefully that doesn't happen 
Yeah, you know, and that's part of the struggle, right? You know, the drought is no joke, and uh, the orchards and the, the solar parks are not labor intensive uh, initially to build the solar park. It's, there's a lot of jobs, but the maintenance of one, there's not. So there, there needs to be something that exists, uh, some policy where uh, you know, it's kind of like being a village next to a diamond mine, right? And then the villagers still have to walk two miles to get water. You know, that's unjust, right? If all these riches are next door. So it's similar in this case where there's a, there's a many gigawatts of power, uh, tens of millions of dollars being generated per year. Well, there's no reason why there shouldn't exist a community benefit uh, 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 agreements or programs in place where the people are benefiting from, from that uh, richness uh, because it's displacing the jobs that otherwise could have existed on a season-by-season basis. Uh, understandably, the drought is is impacting and uh, kind of helping advance some of that, but it's it's it, it shouldn't matter because the people that have been here and continue to be here are part of that population that has helped maintain the food chain in the country, in this nation, and has uh, because they've sacrificed and uh, have done the labor, which is is a skilled labor. Not anybody can get out of the out of their home off the street and jump into the field and think they're doing a good job they'll get fired right or hang in that hot sun at uh 90 degrees or more you know uh and during the summer uh during the pandemic farm workers are still traveling in a van you know shoulder to shoulder buses the same and carpooling to get to those fields to make sure that america had food to eat affordable food to eat you know not so affordable to them because of the wages that they earn Right and the lack of benefits that they uh, that that they, they they have to deal with, but they've been keeping the food chain connected during the pandemic, during forest fires. There's pictures, countless pictures, where they're working in the fields with a handkerchief over their their face and with a red sky, you know. And so the sacrifice has been tremendous, and it's it's and now they're calling farm workers essential workers. They're calling us essential workers, you know. And we've been essential forever, and more than essential, we've been critical, you know. So uh, these projects that are advancing that we be a clean energy state, and that are providing uh, millions of dollars to investors, corporations, and so forth, should be also monies that should become available to help transition farm workers into uh, green economies and uh, help ensure that the education of their children is one that provides them the science and technology and math education to, to be in the field as inventors and engineers, attorneys, professors, teachers, you know, professionals. You know, that's what should follow. Well, cool, man. Well, thank you very much, Ray. Um, I'm, I'm a big fan of Huron, and the reason I went there was to kind of check it out. Um, and uh, I think it's going to be a lot of people are going to be interested to see it. I'm a big fan of yours. I'm a big fan of your city. So you keep up the hard work and leading the way out there and keep doing your thing, man. Okay. You got it, man. And so next time you come to town, let me know and I'll get you one of these. Oh, what is that? Uh, is that a free pass in case I get pulled over? Just in case. City of Huron, La Palpin. Heart of the Valley. All right. I'd like that. Yeah, man. I'll put that on in case I'm drinking my cerveza in the parking lot again and, and the cops come over. I'll just be like, hey, look, Ray, Ray Leon gave me this pin. I'm good. Say, oh, now we're really going to take you in. <laughs> Are you looking to move and need advice? I do consulting. That's right. I'll sit down and talk about where the next perfect place for you and your family should be. I do it all the time. Together, let's find you a new home that's safe and checks all your boxes. And I can also help you find your new house too. Email me and I'll work with you. I'm not just helping you figure out where to move, but I can help you find your perfect home too. That's right. I know awesome, reliable agents all over the country, and I'd love to connect you to somebody who can help you search for that perfect home. Hey guys, if you learned something new about America or what it's like to live in America, great. You should think about subscribing and turning on your notifications. You can also click one of these videos or playlists for more. This is Sage Nick's manager. This has been a Corner House Entertainment production.